go. Um, and uh, can anyone say, are you seeing my slides uh, on the share? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, in the pre-survey for this event, uh, there was quite a lot of interest expressed in understanding elements of the modeling process, um, how these models come about as is a human activity and, and understanding the stages of that, understanding the dependencies in that is I think important for anyone who aspires to be a member of a modeling team, whether as the core modeler or, or someone you know, the person with the hands on the keyboard with the model, so to speak, or whether it's um, one of the essential uh, helpers for that model. Um, I offered my comment that it takes a village to build a good model and um, everyone on that team will benefit from knowing something about the modeling process that's followed. And the modeling process is a, is a element of human theater. It's, I, I argued, you know, a short time ago that it was not the model, but the model A that yields benefit. And it's really the, the process of modeling that we're talking about that yields the greatest insight. It's the, the teams coming together around a model, discussing what's known, what's not known, hearing different opinions on it, and using the model as a tool for communication. And that's one of the more interesting things that's come up about modeling is, is, is how effectively they stimulate communities. I'll come back to that. But a key point here is that often we are shaping not just the mental model of one person, but um, the, the thinking across the team is a clear, uh, clear deliverable. Really, that should say mental models or, or team understanding. And I've kind of put out this this segmented view of modeling, recognizing that it is, it's, it's very imperfect representation, but I'd like to, to, to speak about it here. And I'm going to, to that end, uh, rotate here and, and do some uh, pointing at these, at this slide here. So I think we need that a little bit more uh, yet to, yeah, there we go, okay. Um, and maybe we'll, there we go. Okay. Um, so bodily commenting takes place in a stage fashion. And, um, you'll notice a couple elements of this diagram in terms of characterizing these stages. First of all, there is some natural ordering in terms of um, when these stages are encountered. But there's also iteration. You'll notice that um, these uh, each of these stages has some arrows iterating back to the previous stage. Um, typically, learning involves iteration, involves revisiting concepts you approached earlier with a, with a higher understanding or with a sharpened understanding or with new questions. And modeling is very much in that flavor. Um, there's revisiting. And I'm going to come back to this point quite a bit in this presentation. But broadly speaking, when we're working in a modeling process, we're often first tasked with problem conceptualization, scoping a model, deciding what's in it and in what capacity it's in the model, what things are to be left out for now. And then commonly we map out elements of a system at a more qualitative level. We use diagrams like causal loop diagrams and their variants for agent-based modeling to kind of sketch out at a very high level some of our ideas. These needn't be strict causal loop diagrams. They're, they're tools for kind of getting discussion going within the team, and, and getting different perspectives brought to the table, sharpening language, um, sharpening understanding. And 
this sort of mapping is highly accessible to people without modeling backgrounds. And I'll, I'll come back to this point. It is access, broadly accessible. So you can bring in people of no experience in a boot camp like this and quickly get them contributing to a model map. Um, within the health system, uh, there are things like value stream mapping that are already done, which um, has elements of this related to this. Um, and uh, Yuan Tian, my student who, um, uh, who has played a big role in provincial um, planning, both for the ED Weights and Patient Flow Initiative, the Connected Care Initiative, and the um, uh, in cross-functional planning, and more recently with COVID-19, has done some interesting work on the relationship between more traditional diagrams and health and healthcare and models. Model formulation then involves specification of a model at a formal level, including things like um, the predictors of the structure, the state charts, parameter values. And then there's a step um, that a lot of models go through, not all, but a lot of calibration. And here we're aligning the model to data observed in the world. We're kind of a whole lecture on that. Um, model testing and sort of evaluation and refinement and then often using it for important what if questions. And often uh, there's knowledge translation efforts and dissemination um, sort of at these uh, later stages particularly. So we have a, a segmented process and I've, I've given under each of these in a kind of aesthetically offensive way, um, a description of many of the issues that come up in a given stage, okay? Um, so, we're going to be talking about this elements of this process and hitting a few really big points. Um, so here, um, I want to I want to talk about the first couple of stages of that process we've just seen. Uh, these ones really that go through here, and I want to distinguish something that a lot of people get confused about with agent-based modeling. One of the most common things I hear from someone who wants to do agent-based modeling, I say, I want to do this, but I don't know programming. Um, I, don't, I don't have a programming background. Or they ask me, like, where can I hire a programmer? I want to build an agent-based model. Where can I hire a programmer? And I need to distinguish something. Or three things, right? and people's minds. And this might be a bit of a slippery distinction, but I'm gonna to try to convey it to you. Because people who wanna get started in age-based modeling need to distinguish the challenges at three different levels. In my view, one of the, arguably the most important challenge when it comes to modeling is model conceptualization. Here you're deciding the scope of the model, what's in, what's out, in what capacity it's in. Is it produced by the model? Is it simply put in as an assumption, et cetera? And this is foundational. It's like laying the foundation. It's like architecting what you're going to be doing. Now, in order to then transition the model formulation, now you're talking about sort of the structure of the state charts, or what's captured as a state chart, what's captured with socks and flows, what's captured with discrete event simulation constructs, how to, how to describe the design. And often what we're reasoning about here is some elements of mathematical understanding. Um, we're designing a model. And the question uh, at these two levels is really, am I building the right model? You then go and you implement the models. You seek to put the model into place. Um, you seek to enact it by, by fully realizing it. And this is where programming comes in. Um, and traditionally, uh, it's required programming. Java for any logic. NetLogo has its own language for NetLogo. Um, uh, Repass as Java as well, Swarm as C++, all these different frameworks of different languages. 
but it requires some computer program. This is not the deep thing um, about the model. This is a matter of implementing it. Um, and it does require formal specification, like actual specification of the model, unambiguous specification. Um, and right now, the way in which that's done is computer programming. My group is working to change that. I'm hoping within five or so years, we're going to enormously reduce the amount of traditional programming required for agent based model. And we know how we're going to do it. But that isn't quite available yet. And this model implementation for a lot of people is very, because they say, I mean, I have to learn Java or I have to learn C. And understandably, that's awkward. But this is often the, the trickier thing, um, particularly the first of these model conceptualization. Um, and if you hire, so several times in my life, I've heard people starting out a modeling project say, Should I hire a programmer? A programmer will know computer programming, they will know. They will know jack about this sort of stuff. They'll know nothing. I, I'm tempted to use stronger terms, but I, I shouldn't, especially on camera. Um, but like a programmer won't know anything about the about how to formulate a model. Because programmers are not taught typically to be modelers. They're taught to, to create apps and create web apps, you know, apps on phones and web apps and you know. Uh, do uh, programming in JavaScript and TypeScript or or implement something in Node.js. They don't know anything about modeling the world. So just be aware, there is programming involved right now in HBase modeling and too much as far as I'm concerned, unnecessarily too much by, by a significant amount. But that is not what defines a model. What defines a model, um, your ability to be a modeler is not computer programming. That is the implementation of a plan, which is actually the trickier part of modeling. The trickier part of modeling is coming up with a plan, what you want to model and how you're going to characterize it as a design. So these first few pages deal with, have you built the right model? Is this model appropriate for characterizing the world? This last stage gets involved in, have you built the model right? Have you actually implemented correctly, or did you do something silly like put a times instead of a plus? Um, so the implementation stage is what a lot of people starting up in modeling get get distracted by. They say, "How am I going to do that? How am I going to implement it? How am I going to do the computer programming?" Really, this is 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 the trickier thing for the person who's aspiring to be a a modeler. Of you know the person who actually builds up the exact. Uh, components of the model. Um, so be aware that all of these needs play a role, and the first two are really more about, and this is, involves a lot of domain judgment about the world and about how the system under study works that brings in experts, and then there's some sort of math and probability statistics, sort of uh, um, stochastic systems, um, uh, etc. Um, so just be aware for, for those setting out modeling, it's not just a, a problem of programming. And if you hire a programmer, they'll have no idea how to do these things. They'll be hopeless. Um, okay, let's talk about these stages. Okay, um, any questions about that? What I just said, by the way, there, before I go on. Any questions about this or that previous slide before I dive into some of those stages? Things people wanna ask? Anyone online? Uh, I, I see what someone's saying, yes, but I think that was a while ago, so. Yeah, um, okay. Okay, so um, let's talk about these stages. Model conceptualization, the first stage here. Um, I often make the analogy of models to maps may seem like a strange analogy. You already heard me say models are like crutches and boots, canes and something. Okay, that. that's pretty weird. How about this one of models and maps? How is a model like a map? Well, a model, uh, you know, we when we set to go about around the world, let's say traverse the city, we often depend on maps. 
And a key point of reflection is um, that maps are useful um, in helping us get around the city by abstracting away from a lot of details. Um, we, we get the essential features of the city that we want to navigate. But more than that, they, they help us um, uh, for the task at hand. So if we're trying to bike across a, a, a city, if we're trying to bike across Vancouver, we'll use a different map than if we're trying to take the transit across Vancouver. We'll take a different map if we're trying to walk across Vancouver. We'll take a different map than if we're trying to drive across Vancouver. Um, and if we're trying to figure out why flooding is occurring in certain areas of, of Vancouver or brownouts with the electrical system, we'll use different maps, yeah. So maps um, are specific to purpose. They leave out all sorts of detail and allow us to focus on the essential detail needed to take the transit, for example, right? They leave out all the network of streets and you know where the which streets are one way and where the stop signs are and you know where the crosswalks are um, to allow us to take the transit. Just focus on transit maps. But if we're biking, they'll leave out a lot of the transit details and and allow us to focus on the focus on the bike paths. So models represent abstractions of the world. Um, it's really this ability to omit details about a certain of a of outside of a certain um, sphere that makes models and maps useful. So models like maps are specific to purpose. What we depict in a map is specific to our purpose. What we depict in a model is specific to our purpose. And agent-based models have such flexibility that we constantly need to keep this in mind because there's always the temptation to put more into it, to put more inside. It'll be more realistic. Get this in there. It'll have more of the texture of the world. And we have to resist that. We have to, we have to learn to, how to be savvy to that. I shouldn't say just resist. We need to be critical about that and say, do we need this? Is it really essential for our purposes? And I would argue that with models, it's somewhat trickier to judge compared to a map if it's needed, because sometimes it's uh, it's needed as an intermediate question for dealing with something else. So John Sturman argues that model purpose, this ability for a model to focus in on a certain purpose is what allows simplification, and I, I articulated that. But it, it, he argues that it's it's like a logical knife. You cut away unnecessary complexity um, from a model. Um, most people here would have heard the eminent statistician George Box's comments about models. All models are wrong, but some are useful. And it, I've always had a, a little bit of mixed feelings about that, but you could say that about maps, right? All maps are wrong in the sense that they don't pick the perfect depiction of the world. The only perfect map of the world is the world um, itself. And in that sense, all maps are wrong, but some are useful. All models are wrong, some are useful, yeah. Um, maybe that's a useful um, uh, useful uh, statement. Um, but it's good to reflect that we're not aiming that, that um, having more in the model does not mean it's better. Um, and so establishing why you're building a model, like what set of questions are you trying to answer with the model? What, what problem are you trying to solve with the model is, is really important. And you'll find some of my colleagues, uh, Don Burke or Josh Epstein, um, Amongst them have listed dozens of reasons for building a model. I think Don Burke says 20 to 30 different motivations for building models. And they're very different. Some sometimes we build models to bring people together to have stakeholder dialogue and exchange perspective. There are models built 
that are designed to bring together ranchers and environmentalists and urban planners all in one room who otherwise wouldn't talk and get them discussing these issues and using the model to communicate. We'll come back to that. In other cases, models are used to explain observed behavior within a system. Why are we seeing this growth in the remand population in Saskatchewan, the people in pretrial detention? Why are we seeing it all across Canada? Um, uh, why are we seeing such a growth in homelessness uh, over the past 10 years or you know, a rise in, um, in substance use during the pandemic? In other cases, we're interested in qualitatively evaluating different policy options or ways of arranging a system so that it can be more stable or more effective, you know, uh, designing a system that will be more equitable or less wasteful, et cetera. Um, uh, and and some, some models made to help us think through the implications of just a few things, understand behavior from the world more effectively by allowing us to think things through. Um, so models are used for different purposes, and that shapes what's in them and what's not in them. Now, um, uh, ABM, ABMs, again, have this uh, tremendous uh, flexibility, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and it's easy to add deep levels of detail. It's easy to put the kitchen sink in there. So you you really need to be clear and disciplined about model scope. I do a lot of my modeling with um, stock and flow models as well. And quite quite a big user of system dynamics to box together with HMS models and separately. Um, but there, there's more back pressure because it's harder to represent certain factors in the model. In HMAS modeling, it's easier to put more things in and to get more and more um, overblown, bloated uh, with the model. Um, and there's a lot of questions that come up with HMAS models. Which agent types do I have in there? Do I do I have just patients or do I have patients with their physicians? Do I put in contact tracers as a as a separate group? Um, I, do I represent the lab uh, in there that's performing the testing? Do I have long term care facilities and schools and workplaces? Uh, what about community centers or what about you know? Uh, um, places of worship that could be spread of uh, places where infections spread. Which agent types you have um, uh, is something you need to, to think early and often about. How to characterize agent-based interactions. Do we have spatial interactions? Do we represent networks? We're going to be seeing more of this today, but there are several different ways you can represent agent-agent or agent-environment interactions. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to if you're interested in Hep C and HIV spread, um, are you going to represent uh, sexual transmission networks and intravenous drug use networks? Um, if so, are you going to represent intravenous drug use networks as kind of a static network, or do you want to represent it like people come together periodically to use substances intravenously and they share needles at, at different encounters in a way that might motivate you know needle exchange and, and examining the impacts of needle exchange programs how much detail do we need is a big how, how much heterogeneity we can represent a heterogeneity in our models we saw that we can for each person have different parameters it can be very rich um but how much do we want to capture? How much is it prudent to capture? Um, uh, and to what degree do we consider individual decision making or 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 help behavioral choices, etc.? These are questions which come in, and one needs to be one needs to be careful about them. You know, um, asking what supportive resources exist in environment. Um, okay, um, so. The principle, so there's a high opportunity cost for investing, sorry, there, this means there exists, 
there's a high opportunity cost for investing in a, in a modeling area. When we choose to put one thing into the model, almost inevitably, because of limitations of time, it means we leave something else out. It's, it's almost inevitable. We say, okay, we'll put in dynamic networks for intravenous drug use. We're going to actually have people coming together and using substances intravenously in the model. We'll have, you know, um, some representation of that, and we'll seek to use that to reason about um, the impacts of needle exchange programs. Great. Sounds good. We'll, we'll get some benefit out of that, probably, for looking at certain types of, of interventions. Good. Um. But what are we going to leave out as a result of that? It's not so clear. And, and often our attention goes to what we're getting in and we're oblivious to the fact that we're making choices about A being in and B being left out all too often. Um, so we, we, it behooves us to be very judicious um, and we have to wield these logical knives of model purpose. And the basic principle that I'd like to apply here is the agony principle from software development. You ain't going to need it. And that may sound cynical, but the idea is start simple and add as you go and as you get more and more insight. Don't try to build a huge model up front. Try to start extremely austere, extremely simple, add things in bit by bit and learn along the way. And that, that's a key point because learning comes from the modeling that will shape what you do next. So I'm a big believer in agile modeling, incremental model. The idea here is you build up a model in a step-by-step -step pattern. You, you deliver volume, value all through and you deliver learning all through that informs the next choice about what you add. So you start with a really simple one. You, you add it, it gets you thinking, building this model up, gets discussions going, gets expertise brought to the table, sharpens your thinking, and hopefully you get it to the point where it will run and you run it and you see the implications of what you've represented in terms of thinking. And that sharpens your thinking more. And then you decide, okay, in conjunction with the stakeholders, in conjunction, with people with lived experience or those who are sponsors or other stakeholders, what do I add next? You have this constant learning, adding, experimenting, um, and, and further learning, and then you decide what, what needs to be added next. So it turns out this is very useful, and comparing a model once you've added a feature against it previously um, maybe turning off that feature, this is this idea of docking, turning off that feature first, comparing it, making sure things are comparable, and turning it on and, and, and uh, seeing how the results compare really helps your learning. Because you're learning how did one particular thing I added um, change the behavior. Um, and you can demonstrate these incremental versions to stakeholders. Um, and uh, you you learn from them, and um, and you often spot problems sooner. You can roll things out, out in a faster time. You can change direction based on learning. You can take it in a different direction that you anticipated, et cetera. So incremental modeling, modeling that is um, that is uh, step by step and informed by learning along the way is, is uh, lower risk, high return, and informs this much greater um, judiciousness in choosing what to add next. Now, I want to talk about one of the most important foundational elements of modeling. So this one slide. Um, is one of the most useful things that people can ask about a model. So if you're asked to review a paper about modeling, if you are working with a student in incubator projects and you're trying to plan out a model, if you are in a team with modelers 
and you want to understand a model, one of the first things you should be asking is, is about a threefold division. What things are endogenous? What things are exogenous? And what things are ignored or excluded from this model? So endogenous things are things that are generated by the model, things that are calculated as part of model operation. They are represented and the model produces them. That's that first category there. This camera needs to needs to follow me around more artfully. Um, um, endogenous things are things calculated by the model, things that the model's generating. It gives rise to them. We don't tell them to the model, the model tells us. Exogenous things are included in the model, but we specify them to the model. We say, assume this. Endogenous things, it generates for us. Ignored and excluded things are things that just aren't represented in the model. Often we think about them and we say it's not in the model right now. That's fine, right? It's like saying it's not in the map of Saskatoon we're using for the bike paths. Yeah, sure, okay. Street, you know, the location of the crosswalks are not in the bike path map. Um, uh, sure, we, we know it's not, and we, and we make note of it, but we might want to revisit it later as we go and refine the model. So this is a key division. Endogenous are things the model generates, the things the model tells to us. Exogenous things are things we tell to the model. They're representing exogenously. They're not generated by the model. They're told to the model. They are represented in the model, but they're told to it in a fixed, often a fixed way, a pre-specified way. And then there's these ignored things. So I'm going to have a little discussion of this for this model. So ladies and gentlemen, here we have uh, this model, which we ran, it was our first model uh, that we ran yesterday. You remember it very well. It had the waves of infection. We had susceptible, infected, recovered people and so on. So can anyone tell me here, what things are endogenous? What things are, give me a few things that are endogenous. What are some things that are generated by this model? Anyone? What things are produced by this model, generated by it over time? Sorry? Yeah, the number of susceptible people, right? Absolutely. That's generated by, we, we we, of course, at the very start of the model, we say how many people start susceptible, which is basically everyone except one person. Um, but after that, the number that are susceptible is driven by the model. It's driven by this infection spread in the model, right? What's another thing that's endogenous in here that's generated by the model? Number of infectious people. Number of recovered people. Good. How about, so, so those are some good ones. I like those very, very much. But what are some other things that are determined by the mall as part of its operation, as part of running it, that are determined by the mall? What are some other things? Speed of infection. Yeah, like... So for a given person, in what state they are? So this person up here in the corner, what state they're in right now? That's generated by the model. We're not telling it at this time, make this person in this state, that time. Make, that's what's part of it's running, right? Is that. So I like that. How about, how about something else? Anyone? Well, there's all sorts of things we can say. You know, how many people are getting infected within a given day? Right on a given time period, or or recovered in that day. Right. Um. Uh, what fraction of the population is infected right now? Right. Um. Uh, those those things are generated by the model. Right. Um. These things up here that we're displaying these are generated by the model. Right. They're produced by it. We didn't tell it make this kink in this curve. You know, that was the, that was generated, came out of the model, right? 
That's why we run these models. They, they, they help us understand the emergent behavior that is logically implied by the theory captured in the model. They enact that theory and, and generate this. What things here are exogenous? They're things told to the model, but we don't, uh, but it's not generated by the model. We've told it to the model. Can anyone come up with some of those? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a bit of a cheat sheet here. I'm giving you a bit of a crib sheet because there's a bunch listed. Sorry? Yes, these provided input parameters. So the average illness duration, the contact rate, the infection probability, um, the duration of immunity, those are all exogenous quantities. Are they in the model? Are they represented in the model? Yeah, they represent the model. Um, Impact the model, but not necessarily a product of the model. Exactly. They, their impact in the model, but they're not given rise to by the model. Now, um, let me ask this. As a model evolved, could you imagine this model evolving so that, say, the um, average illness duration was not endogenous, it's not exogenous, but endogenous. Could you imagine a model? Is it possible to imagine a model where the time until recovery is endogenous? Have we seen such a model? Have we seen another model where a person's time to recovery is endogenously generated by the model? And if so, what model did we see that had that? The number of clinics. The number, yes, the one with the clinics. That's exactly right. So, so we'll go and pull that up. This one has a very different division, doesn't it? Um, uh, or, or it has somewhat of a different division. So I'm going to go call it up, the one with the multiple clinics. Why do we say that the time until recovery here a time until a person recovers and goes back to the, um, uh, you know, so gets over their infection is endogenously generated. Why do I say that? Anyone? Because it depends on, this depends on what? Them receiving a message. Well, basically it depends on them going to a clinic. Uh, uh, depends on them going to a clinic. Remember they had to, when they were here, they they would go to the clinic and by going to the clinic, they would get in line and how long it took them to get through here and whether they even got treated before they, before they left um, would depend on how long they were waiting. Remember that? Here, time until recovery was endogenous. Hmm? It's a different division, and that made a huge difference here. Remember that? It, it sort of coupled service delivery, health service delivery, delivery of care to public health in a huge way, right? Um, if service delivery is overloaded, then public health will suffer because people won't be treated quickly, they'll spread the infection, and that will lead to more people needing care, and the vicious cycle can hang. Incidentally, does it this was inspired at a high level by an article about STI services in the UK, which exactly documented this phenomena of um, a vicious cycle between long wait times and spread of infection for STI clients. Um, in case you're wondering where, where sort of I got the idea. There's a, there's a wonderful paper in by White and Garnett uh, from the 1990s, I think. Um, in any case, maybe it was early 2000, it was 2000. Anyway, um, the point is here, time until recovery is endogenous. Mm -hmm. It's generated by the model. And often as the model goes on, we start to ask, you know, hmm, we've treated maybe initiation of smoking as fixed. Maybe we've treated it as you know, age specific, some number, some probability per year of age that a kid starts smoking. And we say this for males and this for females. And maybe we close that on a lot. 
But then maybe over time, we start to say, um, you know, we really like to understand that as, a, as an endogenous quantity as governed by social media messaging. Maybe we're dealing with vaping, right? And we, we want to take into account the adverse promotion of Juul and other you know, vaping products online, or we want to take into account peer pressure effects and kids' patterns of use in schools. And so we start to think maybe we want it endogenous in our model. There's a there's this ongoing evolution of model scope amongst these three categories. But at any one time, it's often very useful to be clear about what are these categories for your model. If you go and you read a paper, you're asked. You, you come to this paper about, you know, um, uh, modeling for dementia and, and you read about this model for dementia, you might want to sit down and say, okay, help gather your thoughts about this model. What's endogenous? What's generated by the model? What's assumed fixed? For example, is the risk of developing dementia at a given age assumed fixed? Or is that something that reflects behavioral habits or something over over a life you know a life course? Um, uh, are we assuming that medication you know um, delivery is something that is is a fixed um, quantity, et cetera, for Aricept or what have you? Um, so it's useful to make these divisions. Okay, um, endogenous, exogenous, ignored. If you remember one thing from this lecture, this has you know, a good candidate for being uh, the most valuable thing. Also important is this idea of incremental model development. Um, so why, why would we include a component in our model? Um, well, it's, it's really interesting. As a modeler, there's, there's an art and science to modeling. And uh, there's this, um, there's this skill that builds up by practice of this again, again, like, like any skill, like a musical skill or artistic skill. Um, you develop, the Chinese would call it Kung Fu. You develop this kind of know-how. You just have this understanding of, okay, to make this a viable model, we need this. And uh, many of the students in the room are developing this Kung Fu. They're, they're developing this skill of how to do this effectively. But it takes time and it takes years to develop this skill. Wade has Kung Fu. Um, <laughs> what, what he touches, he has that. Um, and, uh, and when I have thought to try to Trans, to try to transmit this skill, to try to convey this skill. There's a couple of things that I think of when I, when I am considering what needs to be in a model to be effective. I go through a couple lists um, in my mind and I've tried to get them. Um, there's some wiggle room here. And, and the first of them, I'm especially you have to be especially careful about it. But is it such an essential mechanism that, that captures the essential dynamics? You need it. Um, you, you need it in the model. You're, you want to capture spread of HIV in Saskatchewan. You need to represent IVU transmission because it's the dominant behavior that drives it. If you want to have any reasonable accounting for HIV in Saskatchewan, you have to think about um, uh, intravenous drug use transmission. Um, or look, a lot of the time the question is, do you want to capture a certain intervention? Maybe your interest is in capturing the effects of the Saskatchewan government covering hep C medication for, um, for individuals, and you want to capture that effect. If so, you need to, if, if you're trying to understand how an intervention covering the cost of, of hep C intervention, of hep C medication um, availability on, on um, the health of the population, uh, you want to have a model of that. 
you're going to need to represent something about how hemp C medication affects people's hemp C status and thereby affects their health, right? You, you need it to capture the effect of the intervention in which you're interested. Um, in other cases, maybe an intervention will affect things. Maybe, maybe it's not to capture the effect of the intervention directly, but maybe you're concerned about how uh, an intervention will affect the disparity between high SES and low SES groups. Maybe it's a healthy eating intervention and you're concerned it will widen the gap with higher income individuals having ready access to healthier foods and lower income individuals um, losing out that access. Um, so you're interested in, in capturing these disparities, maybe then you, you want to represent them in the model. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, this one here, but there may be cases where an intervention ends up um, affecting a certain outcome, maybe it's deaths, or maybe it's cases of transmission of HIV, or maybe it's uh, uh, costs imposed on uh, for uh, heart therapy, highly uh, active and director viral therapy. Or if you're dealing with a case where um, you you have some data from the world and you want to compare it against the model because you want to you want to test is the model reproducing data from the world, then you need something in the model that can be compared as what you see in the world, the observables you see in the world. You have empirical data, great. You want to use that to test the model? Great. We need something in the model that can be compared against it. So the model needs to generate that thing. Maybe the model needs to generate the number of individuals who complain of food insecurity and the downtown core of Saskatoon. So it needs some um, representation of food insecurity and people's you know, indication um, uh, the criteria that might be used to decide whether they're food insecure. And finally, um, this issue of stakeholder credibility. Wade, Wade mentioned it yesterday in his presentation um, uh, at a couple of points. The point is that um, there are times where for stakeholders to buy into a model, you need to speak with them um, in their condition at the point they, they currently are. You need to give them something that they will recognize, understand, be confident about. And uh, one of the things that plays a role here is GIS. Um, models, for psychologically, I don't know how to explain it. Wade could probably give a lecture on this as so many topics, but um, GIS has this big impact on certain less technical people's understanding of what, what a model is doing. Just seeing it visually can have a, a psychological impact. There are other things too that can have, have an impact on stakeholder credibility. Speaking to them about stories, um, stories at an individual level or stories at a collective level can be really important. Um, Okay, uh, I think um, I think I'm going to go light on some of these slides, but I, I want to talk about a distinction. This is really important if you get into the modeling space. Um, not all models are the same. I, I, you heard me say it a few minutes ago. Models have different purposes, and sometimes purposes are very different from models. I told you some models are used to gather people together. The purpose of the model is to bring people together. It's not, it's not that you're using it for policy to assess policy trade-offs. You just want to get people together, have a conversation that they otherwise wouldn't have, and share their perspectives on support. There's papers written about this, very successful uses of this model in that regard. But one of the most important distinctions within this modeling space is between stylized models on the one hand. And models that, as my colleague Ross Hammond likes to say, are used for theory explication. He, he tends to use the term theory building models and theory explication models. 
There are some models that are used for sharpening our thinking, building theory, building understanding. It's not that they're depicting, you know, the the situation with uh, uh, with uh, segregation in downtown Detroit, or that they are capturing, you know, patterns of disparity on unreserved populations in northern Saskatchewan with respect to um, to health outcomes, they're really designed to get us thinking about the implications of just a few processes interacting. My Carl, my colleague Carl Simon of uh, uh, of uh, University of Michigan, who, I, um, who, who retired some years back, um, uh, speaks about these as caricature models. So you've all seen caricatures, like political cartoons, right? Um, here in Canada, you'll see, you know, caricatures of prime ministers that are sometimes unkind in their depiction, right? So you'll have someone with a giant chin or something that sticks out, or someone with, with uh, you know, a larger nose or big ears or whatever. And and of course, it doesn't depict the person and all their their physical characteristics exactly, it's a caricature. It, it emphasizes some essential, essential features of the situation that are recognizable. And that's what these theory building models are. Um, theory explication models are models where we have decent theory of like how COVID-19 spreads. We have reasonable theory. Maybe we have two competing theories, you know, one which emphasizes aerosols and another which emphasizes transmission on surfaces, but or or in, in some other moisture droplets. But um, we have we have enough understanding of, of one or small number of theories that we can build a model that explicates it, that that tells us what are the implications of that theory over time. Um, Wade's model from last night had some elements of, of explication, but a lot of it was sort of caricature. It had, you know, sort of representative health conditions that could be affected by waterborne illness, representative needs for, for things like uh, dialysis, et cetera. But um, there were a lot of things that were sort of uh, rough for thinking through aspects of the situation. I'd like to walk you through a model like this. Can I, can I do this? We, we saw that as our first model, but I want to show you a classic model. Can I do it? So this is a model built by a Nobel Prize winner, Thomas Schelling, Nobel Prize winner in, in uh, economics. And it's a famous model in the, uh, in the age-based modeling. And it's called the Schelling segregation model. Can I show it to you? Okay. This is actually not it precisely, but it's a... Uh, it's a very close uh, rendition of it. So let's go to any logic, and I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to. I'm going to show you. Use this opportunity to, um, to um, uh, introduce you to some of the example models in any logic. So if you go in any logic, you do help, and you do uh, uh, example models. Help example models, okay? There we go. Great. You'll notice that there are some examples and some of those have come out of our lab. Others have come from diverse places. There's quite a few health examples. And there's ones for needle tearing. There's ones for, for, uh, for diabetes, influenza, et cetera, a set of other ones here. I'd like you to go and uh, there's something called the Schelling segregation, S-C-H-E-L-L-I-N-G. Do you see that? Okay. So if you go help, so TAs, TAs spring into action, um, shake off, gosh, what is, what is it that Shelley said? Um, um, uh, shake off your sleep like morning dew uh, for for uh, you are many and they are few. Um, I don't know that was lost. Um, okay. Um, 
So uh, who needs help here? Go to help example models and and go down to in the example models, go down to shelling segregation and an open shelling segregation. Okay, who needs help online? Okay, thank you, Marvi. Thank you for, for policing us. That's awesome. Or, or for helping out with that. Yeah. Okay, so this is a shelling segregation model or, or close cousin to it. Um, so uh, it's actually not not a model that's coded in a particularly, it's not a model that's created in a particularly um, visually clear fashion. I have a much clearer version of it um, that's in the example models, but uh, I will describe it to you in rough terms. So we're going to have people placed on a board. Now, um, uh, there's going to be these patches and a given person will live in exactly one patch. Um, people come in two types for this model. They're dichotomous in their characteristics. One is black, one is red. And um, they move. They can move over time um, among patches, among different patches. So at a given time, they're in a specific patch. The state of the model has given each person in a pretty clear patch. But over time, they can move to a new patch. Okay. Um, now, you may be wondering about the name. The deal is that the model examines the implications if people have prejudicial decision making and where they move. If they have preferences based on the color of people around them, maybe they're red and suppose most of the people around them are not red, the black color, um, will they seek to move? They, they will move if there's a certain threshold of people not like them around. Or if the number of people around them that are like of their same color, say red, like them, is too low, they will they will move. And I'm, I'm glossing over some details to move here with a certain probability to understand. This is a model in what's called the street model. Okay. Now, at any one time, there's a certain number of these squares that are empty, and people can move to an empty square. And this bar up at the top will tell us how strong their preferences are. Okay. So I'd like to run this. With your leave, I would like to run this. Um, so I'm going to go run the simulation here. And... We will press the run button. Okay. Now I'm going to lower this initially to a much lower value. I'm going to lower it to like 21% here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to speed it up here. Um, and you can see there's kind of a, a, a mixture um, of, of people in terms of um, uh, their their characteristics is a bit of clumping of red, kind of with red and black with black, but it's not too precise. Wait, would you mind um, checking with this model? Are they looking at their four neighbors or their eight neighbors? Or could someone else look? If someone else who has it up with TA, you, you could look what neighborhood it uses. Is it uh, Euler or Moore neighborhood? Um, M O R M O O R E. Okay, so this is with a small preference. We're going to up that preference. We're going to up it to like 30%, okay? Um, 32%. And you'll see that there's a movement that goes on. Um, when we change it, people are moving around to get in a place they're comfortable with in terms of the composition of people around them. And you'll notice by moving it up to like 34%, 35%, there's actually a little bit more clumping that's going on. You have red with red and black with black. 
let's up it some more. Let's up it to about 50%. And you'll notice four it. Neighbors. Four neighbors? Four eight, 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 eight. So it's, oh, you said more neighborhood? Yeah. M O O R E, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight neighbors. So, so each person is judging what fraction of my eight neighbors, my north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, southeast, and, and northwest, are my color, and it's too small a fraction of the vote. Um, so I moved it up to 50%. You notice it's clumping. Why, why do you think there's clumping going on? Can someone give up? Some some explanation, some mechanistic explanation. Why would there be clumping going on? Why would there be you know blocks of red and blocks of black here? Anyone? Okay, interpersonal relations. It is an implication of that. That's right. And I I heard Atha. Is that uh, Um. So I heard it, they're with people they're comfortable with. There is so so. Or let me flip that around. If they're not comfortable with the neighbors, uh, if, if the neighbor's composition is not meeting what they want, they will what? They will move to a place that may put that comfortable with the neighbors. And so they'll move around. And that's what we saw when we brought it to 50%, a bunch of people moved. I don't know if you saw that. It's kind of like musical chairs. They started moving around and they got to this place. So this is 50%. And you'll notice, though, that these individual movement rules give rise to structure at a high level, right? And that's what Schelling noted. He started playing this. He actually played the first version of this with a checkerboard, with a, with like a checkers, like checkers. He, he played the first game of this. This is in about 1970 or so. And he had a checkers board, and he, 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 he simulated it manually. The, the, this the game. But now, of course, we can do a lickety split, although my students might not use that term. Um, so, so here, what's really notable is that individual level behavior rules that are kind of very simple silos, very descriptively simple, give rise to these macro patterns at a high level. These patterns are what patterns? Fill in the blank. These are just want to say it. Uh, they're endogenous and they are it also begins with E. E M E R emergent patterns. Yeah, yeah. They're not emergent C patterns, they're emergent patterns. That's right. Um, they're emergent patterns. They're emergent patterns. They, they arise from this, all this micro behavior gives, gives rise to high level. Structure, high level patterns, high level regularities. Let's let's up this to you know 79%, right? Um look at that. What do we see there? More or less structure, more or less segregation. More. This is a it's a bit of a troubling idea, right? It can be even small preferences, I right? You know, uh, I, I want to live with people near me can lead. So I, I want to, you know, if someone says I want at least half the people around me to look kind of like me. Um, You can get rise to segregation here if they're more picky and they want three quarters of people around. Me, I can give rise to really pronounced patterns of segregation. Not any one individual who gives rise, right? This is collectively. It, it gives rise from this. This this uh, set of um, people's action collectively give rise to these high level patterns. These are systems effects. They're not reducible to any one behavior, any one person, I should say, but they give rise to this emergent behavior just as much as those other models give rise to cycles. Remember that you saw it earlier. Cycles are these tipping points or these situations where you get locked in. These are patterns that emerge. And these are endogenous, as one was saying. So endogenous patterns. Okay, so this is the stylized model. This model is not designed to depict, you know, residential steering and predatory lending practices and and you know implicit bias by real estate agents in Los Angeles or in in Las Vegas area or in Detroit. 
it's not designed exactly to pick up, you know, the patterns of prejudice in the U.S. South compared to the North. Not at all. It's it's a thought piece model, right? It's a very very simple model. The idea is people use you know two different types, and they use the type um, they they judge what fraction of people around them look like them, and if it's too low, they move. It's about as basic as it can get as a theory, a descriptive theory, but it gives rise to behavior that's very thought provoking, and and it makes you wonder, you know, how much of the patterns we see might result from this. Um, in addition to you know bank, uh, bank, um, you know bank prejudice uh, or prejudicial lending, etc. Um, so this is an example of a stylized model, ladies and gentlemen, and a quite a famous one: the Schelling segregation model by Thomas, Sch by Nobel Prize winning economist Thomas Schelling. Um, high level behavior results from micro behavior. Um, and I want I got to say that many published ABMs lie in both these areas. So if you use ABM modeling in one of these types, and you see a model in the other type, you'll say, "Oh." This is very different sort of agent based modeling, and it's true. Um, the sort of models that are used within the SHA, much more over here. Set of models that you'll find by Ross Hammond or Liz Brook in the literature, um, um, by Josh Epstein, um, uh, are much, much more over here. Rob Axelrod, um, much more over there. Um, there's there's agent-based models along this whole continuum um, and, and recognize it. And it's not a problem. It just requires being clear. These have very different levels of exogenous behavior, endogenous behavior. Often these are highly endogenized. There's lots of endogenous behavior here. Um, okay. Um, so we, we, we saw those. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. And um, actually, uh, for those interested in going, I, I don't want to go into this. Time is precious. There's opportunity cost. But uh, Kurt Kruger, who many of you know, um, uh, when he was a grad student, did some very interesting modeling of trust. It was stylized modeling. It was modeling over here. But we did modeling of trust. We did modeling of trust in the care system. And... For those not familiar with it, trust is one of these huge factors that plays a role in governing um, people's uh, willingness to engage with the care system. Um, risk of re-traumatization, stigmatizing language, um, feelings of not, uh, not receiving culturally appropriate care can lead to a lack of trust, which then inhibits vaccination uptake which can inhibit uh, care seeking for testing for communicable disease or screening for things like um, uh, going for pap smears, going for lung cancer screening or going for first colorectal cancer screening and generally can lead to, you know, really adverse health outcomes. Um, trust is, has as huge implications in the care system. And uh, Kurt did some very nice basic modeling with trust with some care processes, with oral health, um, but also uh, with uh, more stylized models with, with sort of outgroup uh, homogeneity. Um, I will, I, I feel anyone learning agent-based modeling should also know about the following distinction. And, and I, I'm, I'm eager to, to, to get us on to some, some, some network-based modeling, but I, I do feel I wanna comment about this. Within the agent-based modeling landscape these days, you will find two prominent traditions mixing. And I have good colleagues, dear colleagues on, on in both communities. Um, there's the micro simulation community, which is used very widely at Statistics Canada, here in Canada. It's used in many census agencies worldwide. In Australia, for example, it's quite prominent. U.S. Census as micro simulation model for the impacts of like pension plans. Um, but here in Canada, the um, uh, it's it's being used um, uh, for uh, oncosec for for oncological simulation. 
these these um, micro simulation models tend to be minimally endogenous. Um, and what I mean by that is they um, not only do they tend to minimize agent agent interaction, but they tend to have statistical uh, assumptions based on observables on how people behave. And basically, what you characterize for an individual is pretty much their endogenous, or sorry, their observable characteristics. Their observable characteristics, not their underlying one. Um, by contrast, um, something like the models here for the COVID-19 and, and a lot of empirically grounded modeling is also heavily endogenous. And here, you're, you're, you've got observables, but you have some underlying state which may not be observed, some latent state. Um, and a lot of ABMs for policy decision making live here, but a lot of micro simulation models live here. And these two come from different backgrounds, the micro simulation tradition from economics, the uh, uh, this one from, for heavily endogenous, more from computer science and physics. And they're kind of mixing in awkward ways. Um, most of my colleagues consider these both aspects of ABM, but they are rather different. Okay, I think I'm going to go light on the rest of, of conceptualization, but I do wanna talk about one or two other things. This is really significant and profound things. Um, I wanna talk about model mapping. Um, so in the model mapping landscape, um, the model mapping landscape, we are using more um, qualitative forms to bring out, okay, what, what happened there? Bring out understanding from teams, and this is this is an aspect of human theater. Bring together people from diverse backgrounds, um, and uh, you can see some of these from Peter Hoffman, some from my own experience. But um, in all cases, bring together stakeholders to talk through uh, talk through their understanding and capture it often in cause loop diagrams or state charts. Do you recognize those? It's a kind of state charts on a piece of paper, right? Um, and talk through their thinking about how the system works and like what factors are affecting things. Um, it's a very human activity. Um, and uh, we're often pursuing it in groups with people making suggestions and updates and getting discussion going. Um, uh, it's a participatory um, process. My colleague Peter Hoffman relates a story where he uh, conducted work like this in rural India. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, was working with a uh, village council in a, uh, a village in rural India um, discussing issues with livelihoods and ecological um, uh, ecological problems uh, in the area of the village and shortages of water and issues of traditional livelihoods being disrupted. And um, uh, the groups in this village, uh, which, and, and this is a case study written up, um, were discussing um, the situation and diagramming it using causal diagrams. And unfortunately, you could, you could just barely see them on the, the wall here. And uh, what he speaks about is how it was an all-male village council that was doing this. And during the meeting, um, in came uh, a woman um, who was the wife of one of the council members. And she came to, to relay a message, but she came to look at what they were doing. And she, she came and looked at the diagrams. She had no exposure to these sort of diagrams. She hadn't been told how they were. But she started commenting that the diagrams were leaving something important out. And she started volunteering um, uh, suggestions for, you really need to include these factors, this diagram is ignoring that. And they ended up modifying the diagram based on her comments. I say this because this is not an activity for technical modelers. This doesn't require you to attend a boot camp like this to learn modeling. This is something which comes out of um, just a few minutes of kind of learning how to read these diagrams, you can start to contribute in really rich ways. And the diagrams capture understanding from a team. Um, 
uh, that can be used to to kind of um, uh, you know shape different uh, understand different perspectives on a situation. So these sort of diagrams in this model mapping form are key for eliciting understanding. And we illustrate it. This is what's called a causal loop diagram. Um, uh, I'm probably not going to go into this much because, uh, but if there, if people were interested, let me know and I can give a lecture on participatory modeling where, you know, I, I walk you through this. But this is a, what I would call a semi-qualitative um, diagram that is used to capture understanding. I say semi because there's some quantitative components. So for example, if we have substance abuse um, and we have stigmatization, we have a link from substance abuse to stigmatization. What this means is that uh, there's some positive causal connection between substance abuse and stigmatization. If substance abuse changes, it will tend to change stigmatization. So if substance abuse arises, the fact this is a plus arrow means that substance abuse rises, all other things being equal, stigmatization will tend to be higher compared to the value it otherwise would have had. And stigmatization might then lower employability, and hence there's a minus uh, associated with that. And we create what are called causal loops here, which, which commonly include feedback, such as those through self-medication and, and, um, and substance use here to capture kind of our thinking about the relationship between different factors. These sort of diagrams are often a precursor to simulation models. You build a diagram like this often in a group setting, you elicit people's understanding, you can get some insights about this, start to reason about where leverage points are, start to reason about where key uncertainties are, et cetera. And then you can go build a model about pieces of it, a simulation model. These diagrams are not, to be clear, this is not a simulation model. Is it a model? I would say, yeah, it's probably a model. Some, some of my colleagues call it a model map. Yeah, I'd say it's a model of sorts. Um, it gives insights, it gives dynamic insights. You can reason about behavior. Um, positive feedbacks lead to divergent behavior. Um, they lead to instability. Um, balancing feedbacks, uh, not shown here, but balancing feedbacks lead to stability. You can reason some about behavior with these. You can gather them from groups with group model building. And then often we use them to inspire modeling, further modeling. So that's what's going on in this stage, Qu qualitative problem mapping, often in a participatory or semi-participatory way. And we, in our group, we've made use of diagrams kind of like this. This is one tool we made about uh, most of a decade back, uh, kind of a Google Docs-like tool for building up these sort of diagrams for, for agent-based modeling. Um, okay, um, right. Um, I think I'll go go light in this. I think uh, we'll stop now. I'll, I'll just say what we're doing with model formulation, building up models uh, in this boot camp, like we did yesterday, and what, like we're about to do with networks, falls into this model formulation stage. We're building up quantitative models that are fully specified, so we can run them in ways that qualitative mo models aren't. Okay. Um, so we're, we're transitioning to this uh, form. Okay, I think that's all I'm going to to say on those. Um, yes, Zachary is is uh, hit emergent exactly right. Please, uh, TAs, um, if someone locally, someone in the room beyond, I know Marvie's uh, answering questions online, but if if we can have someone in the room who can relay questions or comments from the chat. Because like people are saying things in the chat and answer to my questions, and I want to make sure I know about them, okay, in a timely fashion. So if you could keep track of the chat and relay things people are saying, that's really good. Okay. Um, any questions about this before we take a break, and then we'll get into networks and adding networks to our models. How's that? Okay. Questions though. Questions here in person. Yes. Uh, I I've got two uh, two questions here. So Fatima, Rasha, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, 
So uh, it's just kind of a general question. So yeah. how can we tell that uh, a model is too complex than it needs to be? So this is uh, a tough, a tough um, call. What I would say is, um, first of all, uh, we try to avoid it becoming too complex by um, going step by step, seeing what is needed next to answer the next questions that are coming to the fore and building it up very incrementally. And hopefully we avoid getting too far ahead of our skis, too far over our skis in ways that lead to too big a model. So we try to avoid it. Now, how do you recognize a model that's too large? Uh, I would say a couple of criteria that I would put forward. Um, if I sat down and thought about it, I might be able to come up with a few more, but I'll, I'll tell you some warning signs. Take it from an old man, okay? Um, one sign is if you're getting lost in the model so much that it's inhibiting insight. You're, you're finding it hard to understand what, what is going on with this model because you see behavior coming out of it, but you're not sure where it's coming from, why you're seeing it, what it means. And in some cases, you're not even sure if it's a, if it's a defect in the implementation or an actual behavior of the model. That's a sign that the model is dangerously complex. I have seen models like this from top, top, uh, top epidemiologists uh, in North America, where the model is so complex and so large that they have lost track of where phenomena are coming from. And, and in fact, on inspection by me and my team, we found errors in it. So they were interpreting things as interesting behaviors which were in fact problems, like like incorrect things in the model, like things that didn't make sense. Like, I, I mean, when I say not make sense, they meant to say A times B and they said A divided by B. And then they're saying, wow, that's really interesting behavior. Well, yeah, because it's, it's like, you know, problematic. It's like incorrect in its specification. Um, and, and we try to avoid that with several levels of defense. We try to have things like model reviews by different people. You have a peer review of the model. And, but the most important thing is to build it up little bit by little bit. You add in pieces, you experiment with it, you come to an understanding of how that changed the behavior. If you start to observe strange behavior, you, can, you know you just changed a few things and you could track it down. If there's a bug or a problem, a mistake in implementation, you can quickly um, catch it rather than building up the biggest, greatest model all at once. You know, you work on it for three years and then and then you're not sure, sure what in the world's going on. And, and that does happen. Um, so so uh, one thing I would look for is if you're confused about um where in the world behavior is coming from, you just say, wow, that's weird behavior, but I have no clue what it means. Uh, your model's probably too big. Another thing is, if the model is um, has a lot of pieces in it, a lot of elements, a lot of, remember, these are models that seem like processes over time. There's a lot of processes in the model depicted, which don't seem to have any bearing on a current question or a current need. Um, it's probably a sign that it is unnecessary um, uh, structure in it that 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 you need to question is that necessary? Now it's a tricky thing because sometimes that structure is needed as a kind of waypoint, an intermediate point on to other elements of endogenous behavior that do relate to the things you're concerned about. But sometimes models, a Crete, and, and I gotta say, this is an issue with uh with the COVID-19 model. Um when we built that, you know, we started pre-pandemic. Um, you know, vaccines were not a speck in the cosmic eye. Um, we knew that there was a possibility that there 
would it likely eventually be different lineages of COVID-19? It would probably mutate, but we were, you know, uh, two years out from where variants were a big concern. Um, uh, we didn't have dexamethasone yet, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we certainly didn't have some um, something um, uh, like remdesivir, and we didn't have um, uh, uh, the the the, um, the Pfizer um, uh, not not remember anything, but the the Pfizer antiviral that's uh, that's quite effective um, uh, and but has recurrence issues um, uh, and and so that we were dealing with a lot of questions early on that are no longer there. We were dealing with PPE availability, which was a central issue. We were spending a lot of time estimating. Um, uh, uh, counts of people that that might be needed, um, you know, needing ICU care, and uh, and there were a lot of questions for which the model was used early, which are no longer that current. Um, and uh, and so the model had a lot of structure created for that, which which is not currently needed. Um, uh, there was a time. Uh, so Sabu will remember this probably well. There was a time where there were large outbreaks on uh, colonies in southern Saskatchewan, um, and uh, and you know we had some structure that was created to capture colony colony interactions. These are hydrated Mennonite colonies predominantly. Colony colony interaction and colony city interaction with farmers markets and so on, and people going to the city and. And, and issues with uh, related to this, it, with the anticipation that that would be uh, where some interventions are needed. Um, that was a big interest for a while, for a couple months, but it's now retreated. And the, the models that are put into action often accumulate, they kind of accrete this structure for certain questions that then become less relevant. And one of the tricky things is if there's a lot of structure for things that are no longer relevant, you know, in the current policy context, no longer relevant in the types of questions that are being asked and the needs for comparing the model against real world results, et cetera, you might want to think about removing those and, and simplifying the model. Um, it has its own risks, but but that'll be something to, to keep an eye out for. Um, uh, I um, I certainly think another thing I'd watch out for is, is the model understandable by those who are working with it? If you have a model which people don't really understand what, what is in there, they, they've forgotten what elements are in there, what's not, that's not a good sign um, if they're losing track of you know, what's in and what's out of the model, what's endogenous, exogenous, that's a very bad sign, right? I mean, if it's getting so sprawling that they can't remember that anymore, um, uh, that's worse. Um, and, and one has to be, uh, it's, it calls for simplification. Um, one thing I will say is, Russia, that, that with long-term modeling projects, um, there, there's a pulse of learning that goes on where sometimes you start with a small model, over time you build it, it becomes larger, but lessons are learned along the way. And then at some point, you're so far along the lines of your learning, you realize based on where you are now in terms of your learning and the new policy context and the new questions that are at the table, it's time to start with a much simpler model and you boil it down. And my colleague, Jeff McDonald, the Sage of Sydney, um, who's worked extensively with our group um, and hosted um, quite a few of our students, he, um, uh, you know, he commented about how the most powerful modeling is, you, you, you start simple, you build up a model that, that deals with the real textured issues at a, often at a more detailed level, say an age-based model, and then you sit back and you say, what are the high level insights from what we've learned? And you boil it down into a really simple model that will tell a simple story and you present it to, to key, key decision makers. And you say, this is the essential features. 
We have a model that does all the details, but this is the essence of it. And we captured it in this model. And what this, the story basically is this, and you know, we need to learn these lessons from it. He said, that's the most powerful because it's grounded, it's authentic, you've done, you know, you've, you've, you've walked the walk um, and you've learned from it. And then you, you cut to the chase, you get to the essence, the heart of it. It's often a few little points and bam, you go. I will say um, there was uh, some a year or two pre-pandemic, we were working with provincial ministry of uh, corrections and policing and, and, and social services and um, integrated justice services. Um, and um, they were, they were working with a group on models related to remand, um, to pre pretrial detention, and uh, uh, there there was a lot of detailed modeling that went on uh, before this. But at one point, I boiled that modeling down to a simple stock and flow model with like flow in, flow out, um, and in a stock and. I communicated it and it was explosive because there have been enough discussion from the more detailed modeling that the state, the key stakeholders who were in the room, they just got it. And it was like, oh, of course, that's why it works. And it wasn't that the detailed model wasn't useful. Of course it was useful, it got us there. But it was that simple model that there was the caricature that taught the key lesson that got them to sort of say, aha, I got it. You know, I basically know what the issue is. It cut through all the sort of excess stuff to put the core issue. And the stakeholder, the key stakeholder sponsored that has held that with him ever since. Because it's a simple lesson that can be illustrated with a simple model that came out of the more detailed model. And that's what Jeff does in Sydney um, and, and, and uh, Australia. So um, I would say, you know, um, having a model that's too big, maybe time to start simple again and, and start simple. But now you're starting simple in a different place. You're starting simple with all that work, right? It's not the model, it's the model lane. Yeah, I will also tell you one final thing. Models become cumbersome over time as they grow. Um, models develop weight, models, develop inertia they they start to they start to just get so full of things that it's hard to modify them it's hard to change things and they lose their nimbleness they lose their nimbleness and um and that's a sign that it may be time to start with a new model and uh, again a model that's much more savvy because of where you're at hopefully those comments are, are helpful yeah any other questions online? Um, oh, how can we tell if a model is too complex? Yeah, so that was, uh, I think, thank you for relaying that, Harriet. Uh, so appreciate that. Any questions from people online? Or uh, I think Saab had his hand up, too. Oh, yeah, it was about, uh, he actually partially answered that one already. Okay. It's uh, this policies changes and then uh, people's behavior and sometimes yeah. also, yeah. Uh, plans of the public changes are the stuff changes, testing policy changes, so many things can happen. So, yes, uh, so that's what I was asking about. I was about to ask you, like, what should be our approach to that? So, should we keep the one that we think we might be changing over time in an incremental step, or uh, we just make it a part of the model and in future we need something, we create a new model, right? I think, um, uh, so. I, I will tell you this, um, that uh, if, if you have if you have a, a skilled, um, so so I, I've said it's not the model, it's the model link. And modeling, good modeling takes time. It's about bringing people together. It's about drawing up knowledge of different people's knowledge of different areas of the system. The ICU folks know all about the ICU. The folks, you know. When, in the, in the ER know about how COVID patients are handled in ER, the folks in the, on the contact tracing side can tell you about contact tracing. Folks in the lab side can tell you about how the lab pieces are 
folks up north can tell us about how the local situation is up north and how remote testing is done with the the uh, the remote um, testing machines that are are there, right? Um, and and that takes time. If you have a savvy core modeler or two on the modeling process who, who, who can do the, the very technical side, often rebuilding a model or like starting a model over and building up the core mechanisms, knowing what is needed um, and just saying, okay, um, go, we're, we're gonna start, start with another simple model with these features in it. It's not that hard a circumstance because the data is already in hand, you know, the knowledge, the understanding, et cetera. And um, there's actually something attractive about that to a lot of modelers, like starting over. Am I mis misstating it, Wade? Um, no, no, I think it's fair to be. So, so you know, if, if you took someone like Wade or Narges or, or Nascaran here, um, you know, Harriet and Mattias are developing this. If you were to take them, and, and, you know, if they have a big crufty model that's that's kind of gone a long way, it's kind of your beaten up pickup truck. It's it's taken a lot of hits, but it, it keeps on ticking. And then you say, like, oh, okay, we'll we'll now start, and this is what we want. We have the data, we have the understanding, it's all been worked out. Like actually doing the work to build up the model. Actually, that actually is can go really quick because they know what's needed. They, they they don't have to spend all the time trying to negotiate the data and when can we get you know the the lab data feeds uh, and and so on. It, it, it's all there, and so they can they can deliver it quite quickly. Um, software engineering, I'll tell you. Uh, if anyone goes wants to build software, um, I teach software engineering, and I will tell you that. There's been some very interesting studies on building software, um, say apps, right? Um, a web app or maybe a, a phone app with, with some online services to support it. Um, if you if you build it from the start, and build it up, it takes a lot of time because you're trying to get what's the requirements right for the app. You're trying to get an understanding of how to build it, what are the structures. If you ask that team to rebuild it, Right? Rebuild it, knowing exactly what they need to do, rebuild it. It'll take less than 10% of the time. So it's like you cut through it. And it's a thing of delight often, or it's it's a liberating experience. I suspect Wade's heart would sing to sort of rebuild some, some models because it's just so nice to be able to move beyond the crop and start with something clean. It's like going from your terribly beat up pickup truck to, you know, a, uh, a sleek new electric, you know, electric truck that's, that is um, uh, equipped with all sorts of nice bells and whistles. So, um, so I would say it's, it can be uh, much more economical than you think. It doesn't mean replaying the whole modeling project. It's often a very uh, much smaller technical operation to do it and often yields real benefits. Um, any modelers want to speak up? Yes, wait. Yeah, like it it may take 10% of that time, but that's a non-zero amount of time. That is true. And you have to build that in. Yeah. Like that COVID-19 model for those that have worked with it is a nightmare. Yeah. And I take my share of blame for being in that state as one of the major people working on it. But the, it, like the development process went from from emergency to emergency, like the new research question is like, oh, we got to do this like by next week. And there's no time to go back and remove the crop from all the previous That's right. That's asks right. that remain in that model and are are completely irrelevant to the current right. uses of it. Right? And you gotta if if you never do that, if you never take that little bit of time to go back and clean about it. Yeah, it's like uh, deferred maintenance for physical buildings, right? You have to you have to budget in the time to clean it up. You have to budget in the time to invest. The same thing with software development. You have to budget in the time for getting in place the uh, what's called the refactoring and so on, or else you're going to be 
you're, you're going to be accumulating what's called technical debt, tech debt, which then drags, you're going to be paying interest on tech debt and it's going to end up paying too much. So for modeling, for those working in teams with modelers, give them a bit of time. Uh, Wade was saying, you have to know by next week the answer to this question. I was thinking, man, next week, that's pretty, that's pretty slack deadline, you know. Um, I remember too many where it's like, two days, I got no this or something like that. Or we have to prepare this presentation in two days and run these scenarios. And, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it's tight. So, so that's part of uh, the modeling um, uh, human theater is, is giving, giving people time. Any other, any other um, questions or comments people want to ask? Okay. Okay, so let's take a five minute break and we will get started with networks. Thank you. Yep. Go ahead.